You guys can see me now, right? There is me out here. How's the stream looking now? In Germany today. Okay, first things first, Beato book on sale, 20% off. Code is RB108. So those of you that haven't bought it, now's your time. Actually, anything in my store is 20% off for the next 24 hours. What's up, James? What's happening, everybody? So I am broadcasting to you through Germany. You know what's weird is that I took the hotel internet off and I'm just using the regular, uh, you know, 4G or whatever. And it's like, that's all you gotta do. Okay, I just gotten into my uh, mixing tips here. Um, I've been wanting to do a video about this. I hint at it. I get asked questions about this a lot, about how do you, what's up, Chops, about how to get your mixes sounding great. And this really, these things I'm going to talk about today go across the board. Um, I, as I mentioned, I did a, uh, the, those of you that were just on a minute ago, I did a, a, uh, a video with Pete Thorne today. He's a great guitar player. And... Not to give away some of the stuff, I'm gonna put out the video tomorrow. But um, but you know we were talking about about plugins, about guitar simulators and amplifiers and things. We we're talking about mixing, and um, uh, so it got me got me thinking about this. And I've been talking a lot about it on my second channel. We've been talking about we were talking the other night about bass sounds and talked about the mixer Andy Wallace and uh, and about his mixes and why they sound so good. And there's, um, but there are general principles that you need to go by in order to get great sounding mixes. And it starts before the mixing process, okay? So I started to jot some, some things down about things that are really important. One of the important things is putting your low frequency instruments in the center of the mix. That's why the kick drum and the bass guitar go in the center, because if you don't, then your mixes are unbalanced, okay? You don't wanna have, if you were to, you know, sometimes you'll be looking at the meters, you'll say, what is going on? The meters are a little off. Why is the right channel heavy? I've got the guitars uh, panned to the same place. You know, I've got the, you know, I've got keyboards here, I've got guitars here, but everything's balanced, but it's off, off, but it's a little bit right heavy. Well, if you go in and you realize that your bass is panned slightly to the right by some, you know, for some reason, Anytime you get the, this this energy like that of, of low frequency instruments, it throws off the panning of your mix. It throws off the uh, the left right balance. That's why kick drum always goes in the middle. That's why the bass always goes in the middle. Now there is one exception with low frequency instruments: is that in orchestral, uh, if you listen to an orchestra, typically your cellos are going to be on stage right. Okay, they are low frequency instrument, and then typically the basses are behind the cellos. Further back on the right, sometimes slightly panned in, depending on where they're placed. Now, um, this is a this is just what orchestras sound like with their natural panning. That does not mean that you can't put your cellos when you're doing your orchestral mock-ups. That does not mean that you can't uh, uh, you can't put your cellos in the center and your basses in the center and then maybe pan your violas to one side and then spread your vi first violins out here, maybe your second violins here. You always wanna think about, about where the low frequencies are and you wanna think about your panning, okay? Now with panning, I talked a, a lot about old school. See, back in the, the old days with panning, a, there were consoles that would either give you, they'd give you three different, uh, Tom, I see Tom just said there, he puts his cellos and basses in the center for that particular reason, Tom, right? Um, some consoles used to have left, center, right would be the only positions. You could not get 20% here, 30% here. Um, if you listen to certain records, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting record where the snare and kick are slightly off center is Zeppelin one. I, because of Glenn John's, um, the way that he would pan his overheads with the Glenn John's miking technique. If you listen to it, you'll hear your snare is slightly over on this side and the kick is slightly over there. It doesn't always follow these particular principles. Um, but panning can really be used to accentuate things. Um, 
a lot of times I will take things out of the mix that have high frequency information and put them opposite each other. If my hi-hat is in the left, or in, let's say it's in the left speaker, and I have an acoustic guitar track or something else, a tambourine that mimics it that's in the same frequency range, I will put it in the opposite speaker. If you're working on something EDM music and everything is quantized, it doesn't matter quite as much because things can overlap. But if things are not perfect, uh, uh, you know, perfectly timed, you will have flammy and it becomes noticeable. It's interesting. If you listen to, and I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read the comments better. If you listen to a record that, like Joshua Tree, you too. I was thinking about this, that, that um, there's a song on there that's called, um, oh, there we go. There is a song called uh, In God's Country. It's a really cool, cool tune. It starts out D to A minor, and it's really fast strumming. And if you watch the movie Rattle and Hum, Edge is playing it on his electric guitar, and Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer, is playing 16th notes on the hi-hat. Now, in the video, they don't, uh, they don't uh, compete with each other because Edge's sound doesn't have the same top end of a hi-hat. Yet, on the record, they're using acoustic guitar, and you don't hear the hi-hat. As a matter of fact, it's, it's as if, I don't know if they've removed the hi-hat, but there's really no hi-hat in there because that acoustic guitar actually takes the place of the hi-hat. So um, if they are not perfectly synced, you get flamming between those, okay? And you don't want to have flamming between these high-frequency instruments. It does not matter what, what kind of music that you're doing. You can be doing modern pop music. You can be doing... Um, you can be doing metal. You don't want to have these things uh, uh, on the same side. If, if you're a drummer and you're playing a pattern that, that combines the ride and the hi-hat, okay, you don't want to be uh, pl having the two on the same side. That's one of the reasons they're put here. Well, it's, it's so that you can, it's easier to play. You can play open-handed, okay? But, oh, flamming is when things that go but 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 things that are not lined up perfectly, okay? It's called a flam. On a snare drum, it'd be but 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 that sounds like that, where one hits almost immediately. Two notes that are too close together, that are close together, but not exactly at the same time. Thank you, Strat Cat. That's very good. Um, so, but like my video was flamming when I first tried to do it, okay? So one of the things that you want to look for is your panning. Panning can make or break some mixes. People don't really realize this, that panning is incredibly important to opening up space in the mix. So I would, um, I would really think about that. Fred just asked an interesting question. He said, why are drums not mixed to the sides anymore? Well, you know, they are on certain records, but... When you listen to a drum set, once you get back, you got to think about things like this. If you stand back from a drum set, it doesn't come from either side. It's more here. It's more in the center, right? It's, it's, it's the sides are pulled in. Many times drum sets sound actually more natural when you don't hard pan the overheads, okay? You want to bring them in a little bit and you want to give the kit uh, uh, more of a center a centering effect on it. I like this personally. Put the guitars hard pan or put other things. It's an aesthetic. Same thing, Fred, with uh, when I record a B3 organ and I will do one of these, um, uh, I will do a video on this recording a B3. Now many times, most of the time, I'll record a B3 with three microphones. I'll put two microphones, one on each side of the, uh, of the, the horn at the top that's spinning, right? And then at, on the drum at the bottom that's spinning, I will put a low frequency microphone, something like an RE20 or, or a uh, Sennheiser 421, RE20 is electric voice, or even a Beta 52 if that's all you have. But when I go to mix down, I combine the tracks typically, okay? Because I want the B3 coming from one place. If you listen to old school records, most many of the times you will hear the B3 in one side and you'll hear the or you'll hear the reverb on the other side and this is an old school trick if you think of a song i want to say off the top of my head thank you by led zeppelin organ in one speaker reverb in the other speaker and this is another th way that people would open up mixes 
using panning and reverb as an effect, dry signal on one side of the stereo image and the effect, the reverb on the other side. It keeps those frequencies from, it keeps those things from getting cloudy. Uh, because if they're both, uh, if you have everything with reverbs and they're all coming up the center or in stereo, um, then it, your mix starts to, can start to sound like mush because you have too many things competing in the same area. And if you put everything in stereo, I, it becomes what I call big mono. It's like when you double track the same exact guitar sound. Even if it's a second take, it you want to alter the tone of it so it sounds wider. So typically what I'll do is I'll record, I'll get one sound on one side, go to the other side and maybe put a distortion pedal down, which, which will take the low end of the guitar and filter it going into the amp and it will change the tone and the way the amplifier reacts. And instantly my mix sounds wider. The guitars are, uh, are, are wider sounding with things like that, okay? So another thing for getting your mixes sounding great, filtering the low end. Rhett has a vi good video on that. Rhett has a good video on that, John, because I taught Rhett that. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, I, I need to tell him that I need to get my, my cut from that one. I'm just kidding. Um, filtering the low end. What you want to do is you want to... John, Rhett sat in, sat in on five years of sessions. Um uh, you want to filter your low end from every track that is not a main source of low end. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're using synths and you're doing, you know, electronic dance music or pop music or anything like that. Um, you want to filter your low end. It's very important. I, it's funny because I have a good friend of mine who was just in the new... Uh, uh, his name's Eric J, and he won a Grammy, and he was in a band I produced years ago. And when he first started mixing, he's he's in the new UAD. Ad. There's an interview with him in the UAD uh, magazine, the the thing that they just sent out. And I was just cracking up because I could hear myself telling him this 15 years ago, and now he's a big mixer, and uh, uh, he's a super talented guy. I'm gonna bring. He was in one of my favorite bands that I produced. He was the lead singer of. Uh, that I'm playing. He, it was him. Uh, the band was called Essex. And the drummer for Jeff Buckley, um, Matt, was the drummer for, for Essex. Um, okay, filter the low end. And, and he goes on, he talks about this, and I was cracking up as, as he was saying this. So your low end instruments are going to be your bass and your kick drum. Those are typically the things that are going to produce low end in your mix. Everything else you need to filter. When I say filter, that means you shelve the bottom end or put a high pass filter on it. Now, where you put this is, um, is important. What you don't wanna do, you don't wanna strip the character away from the instrument, number one. And number two, when you start taking bottom end away from an instrument, it uh, produces an effect that would be kind of akin to masking, okay? If you want, I'll give you an example. If you want, a, if you have a sound that's really bright, instead of taking the top end and lowering it, you can add low end to it. And that low end on the sound will mask it, okay? Uh, by the way, speaking of masking, Beata Book is on sale, RB108. You guys buying stuff from my store, buying mugs or anything, keeps me in business, able to make videos on here. I couldn't be here if it wasn't for people buying stuff in my store because we don't get paid to come here to Germany to get con. Um, anyways, so filtering everything that doesn't have low end. Next thing, because you're filtering everything with low end and you have, um, oh, what I usually do for the filtering, I will play the track, then I will high pass it up until it's noticeable where the high pass is. Yes, thank you, Kent. Join the Beato Club too. That's another way you can support the channel. You bring the high pass filter up to when you actually notice it, and then you then you move it back, okay? Because as soon as you notice it, it takes a minute for your perception to kick in, okay? Drop it back. Don't filter it, because sometimes you'll go, oh, I don't notice, I don't notice. And next thing you know, 
your filters at 250 hertz on your, on your guitar or on your keyboard pad. And then you realize that, well, you actually, uh, you actually notice those things. Uh, you will eventually go backwards with it then. Go back down, you know, 50 hertz or something like that, okay? So back off it. Um, another thing. You have to decide what is going to represent the low end in your mix, okay? So the when I say the low end of the mix, is it going to be a bass heavy mix or is it going to be a kick drum heavy mix? A bass heavy mix will sound one way and a kick drum heavy mix will sound another way. Uh, a kick drum heavy mix, obviously with the kick drum is pulsating and the bass can be, you know, depending on how it's played, can be a much more consistent sound, right? Now, if you decide, oh, I want a, a bass heavy mix. Well, if you have a bass heavy mix, there's another thing that you have to, um, that you have to take into account is the bass played consistently. If the bass isn't played consistently, this is why you typically will compress the bass is to get the low end consistent so you don't have dropouts. Because uh, uh, some people say, um, uh, somebody just mentioned Children in Bloom, Counting Crows, that's one of my favorite songs. I love that tune. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. Boom! Gone. Um, so, let's see here. Like the bass on bass drum on audio slave. Certain um, records will be bass heavy and certain records will, will be kick heavy. Guys like Andy Wallace that I was mentioning that mixed a lot of did Jeff Buckley and, and uh, Nirvana and System of Down and Linkin Park and you name it, every heavy rock record out there. Helmet. Andy Wallace would be a kick drum heavy mixer, okay? Even though he had a killer bass tones, he, he always would mix the kick. He wanted you to feel the kick drum there, okay? That's, you know, that's a certain type of mix. Whereas if you listen to uh, a lot of records, like U2 records, for example, U2 records are very bass heavy. The low end is the underpinning. Um, that That is a... Uh, you know, that's, it, it's really from record to record, and it's something that people decide on when they start making a record. And, okay, Michael asked, why would you choose one over the other? They're really two different sounds. You know, if you have a, a if the kick drum is taking up the low end, right? Every time the kick drum hits, if it has odd patterns in it or something, um, then it can be distracting. There's a great song on uh, A Perfect Circle on 13th Step. It's called uh, Weak and Powerless. Anybody know that song? It's a really great, great song. And it has a steady do 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 It's it's Josh Freeze playing, and the kick drum is really dominant and it never stops. Yet it is incredibly consistent. That song is a beautiful song. Uh, yet it is kind of a bass feature though. That's the thing. So the song starts with bass that's playing chords. It's, it's a, it's a very cool pattern and, um, and, but it's, it's a kick drum heavy song. So these things are not, uh, but, the, but it's, it's not a bass heavy song, but the kick is the heartbeat. Ray just said it. Kick is the heartbeat of that song in particular. Um, one of the things that Andy Wallace does, I talk about this a lot, is that he puts a pitch change on his bass all the time in his mixes. He would do, um, he uses Program 15 of the SPX90. Now, Program 15 is called Symphonic, and it's a pitch change. So it has modulation on it, too, um, and it actually makes the bass in stereo, and it moves between the speakers. And when it has that little movement there, it actually makes the bass, bass more present. It may, makes you able to, um, uh, it, it makes the mix less static, okay? 
Anytime you can put any type of modulation on an instrument, it makes it less static. If you put delay on instruments, it makes it less, less static. Um, Serbin, who's a great mixer, mixes all Max Martin records. He mixes a lot of stuff on the radio. I don't know if you know if you know uh, Serbin, but his he does things like he'll he'll take a um, he'll use different delay lengths on different instruments. He will um, maybe have a triplet based delay on a vocal. He'll have an eighth note based delay on another instrument. Things where where it's actually obvious to hear. And he won't necessarily do them at the same tempo of the song. And one of the reasons is that if you have all the delays over apt overlapping exactly the same, it gets that you don't hear them, okay? Um, many times what I will do is I will, um, I will alter the... On each side of a delay, I'll make one slightly shorter or longer than the other side. So the delays are kind of working like this and they move between the speakers. Don't set your delays to the same time. Don't put them at, you know, 340 milliseconds set to an eighth note or whatever on both sides. Set one to 340 and one side to 350. That will get your movement uh, uh, that will get them to, to move between the speakers. Now, somebody said to sidechain your kick and snare. Um, I don't really believe in sidechaining your kick and snare for something like this. Sidechaining to me is used as, a, as an effect. It's great on keyboards, things like that. Um, you know, you use it for voiceovers, for ducking things in the background. That's what that's what side sidechaining is good for. For the, for the bass and the kick, you have to decide where each one lives and then you'll either shelve one in one place or you dip the EQ in one place and you'll make one thing stand out from another. Uh, if I have a bass heavy song, it's gonna have probably um, uh, maybe a, a 60 Hertz will be accentuated in the bass. Whereas in the, in the uh, I'm sorry, in the kick drum, no, in a, in a bass heavy song, and the kick drum might have a hundred hertz, will be uh, will be accentuated in the kick drum. Okay, if you side chain th things like that, I see this pumping effect. What you don't want, you don't want your mixes to pump, unless you're really going for that sound. Pumping is where your mixes sound like they're breathing. Now, if you can get the things to actually breathe in tempo, it can actually be a great effect. That is the effect that you're hearing, and when the levy breaks, Andy Johns that mixed it. In addition to having the echo, which is pretty much in time with the song, duh, 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 duh. thank you, Andre, for, for that, for buying the book there. I saw that. I saw that. Beato book is on sale, like I said, 20% off. RB108 is the code. When you guys buy it, put it on here that you bought it, and I'm going to give you a shout out, like Andre. That was very cool. I really appreciate that. You buy anything in my store here, buy a mug. The modes of the uh, harmonic minor scale or melodic minor, boom. Um, so uh, don't look to side chaining for getting your, uh, uh, to get your bass and kick to have separation. That comes from your sound and how they're sculpted, okay? You should not be done by that. The other thing that affects that is your release of your bus compressor, okay? Now, in the old days, we had, uh, you know, if you're mixing through a console, if I was missing, mixing through an SSL, a G+, most people will use auto and use auto release, which is program dependent, okay? But you can very easily use one of the, pre, one of the preset that has five uh, positions on it with uh, 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 on the release and the attack, I think five or six. And you can adjust it till it... Uh, works with the tempo of the song, okay? Because that's really important is getting your bus compressor uh, set to the proper um, setting. Now, people that I've seen, like Andy Wallace, for example, sometimes he'll go plus 8 dB in, in compression, in mix bus compression, a tremendous amount. Some people are very light on the mix bus compressor. Um, I worked with with uh, Ben Gross, who, who maybe will only hit it 2 dB, okay? But he's got compressors on almost every track. Um, uh, you know, some guys 
will really hammer it. But you, what, what, once again, what you don't want to do is you don't want to get into brick wall limiting on your mix. You got to leave room for the mastering engineer to do something on it. Okay, so let me talk about a couple other things here. Um, so movement and imaging is incredibly important. Um, anyone use vocal rider? I've used vocal rider before. Okay. Um, your monitor speakers. This is another really, really important thing about your mixes. Um, you have to have multiple monitoring sources if possible. Somebody just bought the book. I just saw it there. Awesome. Um, you got to have multiple sources, not just your, your stereo monitors that you're using. I typically like to have three sources. So I have uh, NS10s connected to a subwoofer, and I have these things called events, uh, P PS6s that I've had for 18 years, 19 years. And then I have a little clock radio that I have an aux out that is plugged into. Um, I will spend most of my time on my main mixes getting the, getting the low end right, okay? Getting my pan and getting my EQs right. Then I'll go over to the small speakers and I will work a lot. I'll also put it through, uh, sometimes I have an old Mac that uh, has really small speakers and has an aux, has an input in it. I will go to that. That is where you judge your harmony levels, where you can judge the, the vocal, lead vocal, along with the snare drum. That's where you can judge if you can hear the bass or not. Because typically, if you're listening through a, a phone, people listen on phones, they just do. And you gotta take that into account. You can't hear things below you know, 300 hertz on a phone, all right? But you'll notice that when you actually goose that 300 hertz on the bass guitar or your bass instrument that you will hear them, okay? You'll also notice it if you add distortion. Distortion will bring out things in the mix, your snare, your bass, it does not matter. Distortion brings things out because it adds harmonic content to it, okay? It makes the waveforms more complex and it's easier to hear. And if you don't believe it, all you need to do is take a sine wave with a sine wave generator app on your phone, go up as high, I mean saturation, distortion saturation. Go up as high as you can hear, okay, with a sine wave. Once it gets to a certain height, you're gonna go where you can't hear it anymore. It might be 16K, it might be 18K, whatever it is. If you get that high and you'll see the sine wave, if you click in a square wave, you will hear it because of the type of wave it is. And when you add distortion to things, it works in the same way. It makes it more audible. Um, you shouldn't take phones into the account. No, you should take phones in the, in the account because you've got, once you have all of your uh, EQs and everything right, then you already know what it sounds like. And if you can't hear it on those things, those things will actually bring out, uh, who is that from? Seek, what was that here? Thanks for everything. Oh man, Tony, you are very welcome. You're very, very thank you. Um, once you, um, uh, if you can hear things on there and you realize that you're, uh, a lot of your imperfections of your mix are going to come out on that. Now somebody, Mark just said, what about mixing in mono? When you're listening to a, a small speaker that's that's five feet away from you, you're listening in mono. That's that's mono. Anytime you get out of the field of, of where your speakers are, where the throw is of your speakers, you're listening in mono, okay? You don't have to check in mono. Walk to the side of your speakers and you're hearing it in mono. You will hear these kind of anomalies. People don't, uh, people don't listen in mono and things are not summed that way, right? So, cause you can do some really cool, uh, you can do some really cool phase effects uh, that would never work in mono, but since people don't listen in mono, you don't have to worry about it. And I would never base anything on that. That's kind of something you'd use mono to check if your microphones are in phase. 
Uh, that is really a big thing with it, I think. Um, there's very few things that mono that going to mono is going to affect, okay? Because uh, um, the only thing that that going into mono uh, affects are things that are multiply mic'd. A bass guitar that has a DI and an amp, that's not even really, you still have some delay on that unless you delay the, uh, um, unless you delay the DI to line up, all right? Walk out of the side to the side of the speakers. If you wonder what a microphone means to be in phase, watch my video that's called Phase. Um, so walk to the side of the speakers, listen to it. You will start to notice uh, imperfections. Phase issues are checked when you're recording. That's when you check the things. The, I'm assuming that you know how to put things in phase when you get to your, when you're mixing, you're not, uh, typically you're not going, oh, is this in phase? Is that in phase? No, you get things in phase while you record them. Your drums are in phase. Your rack tom is in phase with your snare. Your snare is in phase with your overheads. This stuff is done when you're tracking. You don't wait till you're mixing. Oh, let me check the phase on this. It's like, duh, you think that, that people are going around, you know, first of all, it only comes into play on multiply mic'd things. That's where phase is affected. Um, so, um, and I will go up against anybody with a mix where I'll just mix it in stereo. They can mix it in mono and we'll listen to their mix. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, oh, I'm gonna mix it in mono. Um, you get the you get the phase right to begin with when you're tracking it. Okay, next thing. Uh, there is a plugin that is really really great, and it's called the Magic AB. Does anyone know that? I've owned this plugin for years. The Magic AB is made by a company called Sample Magic, and it, it's a great. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a MythBuster thing, HK. This this uh, checking in mono stuff. Um, uh, I'm gonna do a video on that. Um, anybody know about the Magic AB? Magic AB is a plugin that is incredibly great because um, uh, with you can it'll hold nine mixes. Um, it will hold nine mixes in it, and each mix you can isolate the exact um, section of the song that you want to reference. So if it's only the chorus, the loudest part of the song, let's say that you're like, you know what, I really like the, uh, I really like the compression on this mix, and it's Audio Slave or something. God, I love the compression on this mix. It sounds killer. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, what is that song? Um, bun, bun, dun, 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 dun. Uh, is it Cochise? No. Um, you know what song I'm talking about. And it's got great, great, the, the compression on the mix is so upfront. Um, and, uh, and, so I would isolate that song. If I'm doing a song similar to that or whatever, I would isolate that section of the song and I would, and I would show me how to live. Thank you, freedom. Thank you very much. It is show me how to live. I think. Yes. Um, and the whole album is amazing sounding. So I would take, I would isolate. So you, it allows you to loop just a small section of the song. Okay. You also put it last in your chain on your on your bus um, on your master bus. Okay, so let's say you've got your compressor, you might have an EQ after your compressor, and then you have the, your Magic AB, or maybe you'll have two compressors on your mix bus. Sometimes I would use two compressors. I would use a um, uh, back in the old days. I would use a multi um, multi band compressor, and then I would use a second compressor behind it. Put the Magic AB on there. You got nine tunes. You can do, you can take, uh, you can make, oh, this one is for, 
country songs. This one's for metal. This one's for rock. This one's for EDM. And you'll take the best sounding songs that you know, you put them in there and it will save those, um, it will save those things in there. The reason that you put it at the end of your channel after your bus compression is so it's not affected by the bus compression, okay? And you can literally start your mix, that's your A sound, then hit B and it'll go to whatever pre-selected song you have and it will play it. Okay? So that's a great way to A, B it, especially if you don't have a lot of experience with mixing. Another thing I do is have a dedicated subwoofer, if you're able to afford it, that you can actually isolate the subwoofer from the main speakers. It takes the crossover point and will play only the subwoofer. That's how you can tell if you're getting some really weird things that cause woofer excursion or cause mud in your mix or take energy away from your mix. By listening to just the low end and seeing what other great mixes sound like in the low end, it will give you an idea as to what you, are, you have too much of or what you're lacking, okay? Uh, so subwoofers are very important. They can be placed anywhere in the room, pretty much. Um, they can really, um, they can, they can really be any, necessarily, um, uh, worry about that, about not having room for it. You can, my, mine is placed off to the side, but it fills the room with low end. Bass waves are very big, Okay. Um, so this Magic AB, I would invest in it. I, I want to say it's like 15 bucks for the plugin, and it's a great plugin. Um, bass compression, or bus compression, I mean, bus compression. Um, I pretty much always use bus compression. Almost every, no, not almost every mixer. Every single mixer that I've ever worked with has used bus compression. Um, And, uh, hold on one second. Who's this guy here? Um, welcome to Europe. What, who, what, I don't know who this guy is. It's asking me these ridiculous questions. Um, so... At virtually every mixer I've ever worked with uses bus compression, and they put it on right at the beginning of the mix. You know what bus compression? I mean, a, a, a compressor on the master bus. No, the bus compression should not be left for mastering. You can, except your mastering engineer is basically going to determine what your mix sounds like. No professional people... Um, no pro mixers use uh, uh, go without a bus compressor anymore. Bruce Swedeen that mixed Michael Jackson, he would never use bus compression back in the old days. It's ridiculous. Compression is part of the sound of your mix. And people use it. Um, whoever your mix, whoever, whoever your mastering friend is, says no EQ on the mix bus is wrong. That's another ridiculous misconception. Uh, every mixer that I know uses EQ on their mix bus. They just do. Any of the guys, you know, they'll use something. Joe Barisi, you know, they, they all use it. Randy Staub that I worked with, they all are going through some type of, of extra step of, of some EQ. It may be a Sontech EQ, it may be a, a GML something, just to add a little bit of, you know, maybe you put a little bit of 10K on it. Um, maybe put a little 60 hertz on it, whatever. You make it as good as you can make it sound before you give to the uh, mastering compressor. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to squish it. You don't want to make it where it's un, uh, where, where there's nothing they can do with it. You don't put brick wall compression or limiting on the master bus. You do not do that. You have to have movement in your mix. You've got to have peaks and valleys. It should not be flatlined when it goes to the max mastering engineer. How do you tell if it's flatlined? Because when you look at the waveform, it looks like a straight line. You want to see those still, okay? You want to see those. Those are incredibly important. Uh, do I EQ before or after the bus compressor? You know, 
I've done both. Sometimes I don't do any, but most of the time, I will uh, I will typically EQ before the bus compressor, but but uh, um, do so typically. I will use um, I will use a multi band compressor. Uh, I feel like you can isolate certain frequencies, and um, I think it can. Um, uh, I th I think it can it can be. Uh, you can use it in a gentler way than you can use with it. If you have a good sound of EQ, um, Citizen Nobody says if you the EQ. If you EQ the bus, it will create phase. It doesn't create phase. It can change the phase, though. It's not, it can create phase anomalies, right? Um, you want to be careful. Um, uh, a lot of people use, okay, stereo spreaders. I've used stereo spreaders on the mix. But typically, if I'm going to use any type of, of spreading effects like that, I will do them. Uh, I will put them um, on things that I think you want to, um, like, like if I have something playing the same parts that I want to have hard panned, I'll put it on those tracks specifically. Make them go outside the, uh, you know, make them sound a little bit wider than they would normally sound. I think that's uh, that's kind of important. Uh, what volume to send your mix to the master? Minus 18 D rule? No, that's ridiculous. Way higher than that. No. I would never send something that quiet to the mastering engineer. It's ridiculous. Get the thing sounding as close as possible. All right? Number one, if you're working with a professional band, you're going to want to hear uh, stuff that's put through a limiter. No, so minus 18 dB is not okay, Renzo. That's too low. No, you don't want to mix that low in volume. It's ridiculous. You leave some room for the mastering engineer, but you don't leave that much room. Um, what's up, SB? Minus six, that's probably a good rule right there, HK. That's, a, that's about right. Uh, that leaves way too much room. Also, if your mix is minus eight, uh, is, is at, you know, minus 18 dB, when you go to send it out to people, to the band, to the artist, whoever it is, and you slap a limiter on that, it's going to change the mix dramatically because typically people want to hear that stuff. Um, uh, so let's see here. Um, so then the other thing is to, t is to, um, then is to figure out what is really lacking your, you know, once you get your mix close, uh, you, you want it to have dynamic range from section to section. And that may be a thing where you actually ride, uh, that you reroute it back through the, you know, through Pro Tools or whatever, you're going, you, it, it, it all depends on how you have your mix set up. Um, is to uh, do rides after the master bus fader, okay? Now, a lot of people would, would bring it back through the board and they would actually ride up the choruses, okay? So that they have more impact. So you do your rides in the song. That's the last thing you're doing in your mixing, typically, is that you do all your rides with your instruments. What you don't want is you don't want a static mix. You can't let things like compression do all the work for it. Compression can't ride your guitars up in the chorus. Um, they, they, uh, they can't create excitement like that. You need to do this. You need to have dynamics. You got to ride your tom fills up. You gotta ride your crashes up and back if you're using an, an acoustic drum kit. Those things are incredibly important. In a dense mix, the cymbals will go psh, and they'll disappear. If you ride them up psh, and then pull them back, try to ride things that disappear in time with the beat. Why, does I, why do I sound so hostile? Um, 
Do I sound hostile? I always sound like this. Do you guys think I'm sound hostile? Uh, um, I will go in, I will ride every Tom Phil. I will ride every Crash. I will ride every, um, I will ride every guitar up in the chorus. I will ride up the, um, I will ride up the bass guitar in the choruses. I'll ride, that's how I sound. Thank you, Tom. Um, I will ride things up. And then later on, once I feel like I have my mix really close, then I will go and I will ride the sections afterwards. Okay, so that my choruses are getting louder in energy. They're, I'm talking after the bus compressor. I will do that many times. I don't always do it. I don't always do that. Uh, what you don't want to do is, is you can't just ride the stuff up if you're riding into a bus compressor. You ride the things on their individual tracks, okay? And then you set your bus, bus compressor to that. But the, the real key is to put the dynamics in the performances because that's where it happens. Don't wait to do the, the stuff in the mixing. It's kind of like checking your phase in the mix. It's like, bro, you check the phase when you record the stuff. Um, that's when you check it. That um, you don't wait till the mixing uh, phase to do that. Um, Storm Fox, you're very welcome. Uh, Beato book, by the way, I'm going to mention it again while we're on here. Uh, RB108 is the code. That's how I'm able to make videos for this channel is literally because of that. Just people buying my book or buying mugs. You can become a member of the Beato Club and support me through that. I'm here because of the Beato Club. I was able to take a week away and do this. This is amazing. And I'm going to spend the extra two days in, um, in Leipzig doing my video on Bach that I'm doing. Uh, thank you, HK. You're amazing. Do you choose specific parts of the arrangement to add in the mixing? Um, classical rig is never hostile. Yes. Um, okay, so there's there's different types of... of that's, that's production techniques, H, HK. Um, uh, there are two ways to create excitement in your mix. There's excitement that can be done... Uh, through at people playing louder in their choruses, like, you know, having your guitar where it's not, I'm talking things that have dynamic range, or let's say you're playing a keyboard part, okay, and you go into the choruses and you actually ride up the volume fader, or use an expression pedal to, to increase the volume as it's going into the chorus, and you swell into it and you do that. The same thing that you would do on a B3 organ that's got a volume control on it for that reason. It's got a pedal, because you can't play with dynamics if you don't have that. So uh, things, you either do it through performance or you do what I call additive production. Additive production is when you add things to make the chorus sound um, exciting. I'll tell you something, HK, it's funny because a lot of times I'll get, I would mix most of the things that I produced, but I get hired to mix things. And I, sometimes I get hired by people that would have really, you know, maybe tracks are not produced that great. So what do I do? Do I let the thing come back sounding like they had it? Or do I add parts in when I'm mixing? And of course, you know what the answer is. I always add parts when I'm mixing. Um, add volume production elements to it because... And you know, people, I add stuff in and people don't know. I'll add guitar parts in the chorus because it needs it. And they realize that I've done that. They just know it's like, man, that mix sounds amazing. Well, I've tracked about 10 parts on the song, you know? And, and there are some producers that will actually add parts to things. I know some that are famous producers that worked on famous tracks in the mix down when the band's not there have added parts. That's just a fact of life. Go watch my video on Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, Tom Wilson that produced it after the band had broken up uh, and in and got three session, four session musicians to come in and do it, uh, to come in and pull 
play on on that's the one that you hear, and that's why they're a hit decision. Um, Chad Blake does it. Citizen Nobody says that. I talked to Chad Blake about it. Anna, uh, I I don't think this is a secret. If it is, I'm going to tell it. That on um, Black Keys record, um, the first one he mixed, that he added samples to it. He said that there were about, each song had 10 to 12 tracks that came in. It was recorded at um, at uh, Muscle Shoals. Um, and um, and he said that they the drum sound are really dead, really really dead, and so um, he added samples to it and he put added distortion, did all this stuff, and the band loved it. And uh, there's no secrecy par policy, Martin, but there may have been secrecy with Chad telling me this. Although no, I don't. Chad told me this, and he hardly knew me, so. Um, and the band loved it, and they said, do more, and add more, and he added more distortion. But the drums have samples on them. They do. This sounds totally organic. And it doesn't matter what is done. All that matters is what effect it has on the listener, if it sounds good. If it sounds like it's analog and it sounds killer, um, uh, <laughs> Rick seems more competent. What, Shrink? 1987. <laughs> Okay, Magic AB, Renzo, is 49 pounds. Is it really that much now? Well, it used to be about 15 bucks. Sorry, but it's worth it. Spend the money. Um, did George Martin add a lot to the Beatles? Of course he did. He played parts on there. He added arrangements. Come on, George Martin was the fifth Beatle. Uh, you're, oh, you're, oh, sorry, you're responding to something. Oh, so, someone else. Okay, sorry. Uh, mixing recording in 48 versus 96. 44 or 88. Almost everyone that I've producer, producer, I ask them, and they always say 44. Um, why is sound so interesting? I have no idea. It just is. It's unbelievably interesting. Um, it's like adding hair extensions to your wig versus wearing a wig. <laughs> I like that, Julie. That's good. Uh, that is good. Um, where can you find analog equipment? Anywhere. The real question, 4, 430 versus 432. Somebody just bought the book, just sold another one. EQ tips, please. I have a whole video on EQ. I should EQ stuff. Stuff, but it's hard to it's hard to make you can make generalizations on EQ, but unless you actually hear the tracks or the instrument, you can't. Um, I know things to cut, like an on, on an analog piece, an, an acoustic instrument, like a tom. If you want to make tom toms sound like they're not made of paper, you'll take out mid range, like four hundred hertz out of them, five hundred hertz. There, all of a sudden, boom, they start sounding like real instruments, you know. Those are, um, um, that's kind of, those are, uh, those are things, that, those are generalizations you can make. Uh, you know, I told you, you know, boosting at 300 or so, you're going to be able to hit, you're going to be able to hear stuff on your, your laptop base I'm talking about. Um, Rick said, do compress the mix bus. That's correct. I did say that. Um, okay, so that's good. I don't want to go too long. We're at 54 minutes here. There's a lot of information in this. Get the Beato book. Sign up for the Beato Club. It's, that's the lifeblood of, that's how I am able to make video. 108, 20% off anything. Long Trang, what's up? That's how I, how I uh, make a living so that I'm able to come over here. The Beato Club is, is, has done that. Um, so leave questions down here and give it a thumbs up too. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up. I don't know if that makes a difference actually, but I think it does. I think it's important to, uh, to, you know, get on the video, you click thumbs up, leave a comment. Comments are huge. 
the more interaction there is with uh, um, between you guys and me, it's not just about this. It's coming back to it and leaving a comment. You know, leave whatever thoughts you have. Those videos get pushed out more. You know, share it with people. Uh, RB108 Beato Book. Um, when am I going to start a gaming channel? Probably soon. And you know, with all my free time, I'm going to do a, do a game, gaming channel. <laughs> you guys are the best. Thanks so much. We'll see you tomorrow. I got a new video coming out tomorrow.